Hi folks, I'm Jack Kennedy and welcome to episode 5 of Farm Tech Talk. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the support of Ornua, FBD, MSD Animal Health and Board Bia in making this outside broadcast happen. For the discussion today, I'd like to welcome our beef editor, Adam Woods, our dairy editor, Aidan Brennan, and our sheep and schemes editor, Darren Carty. Um, it's a key time of the year, I suppose, in terms of um, animal health. Um, on farm, so I said I'd have a chat with uh, MSD Animal Health General Director Fergal Morris just to get a, his feel, I suppose, in terms of vaccine supply and you know what restrictions might or might not happen in COVID Ireland as we have today. Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Jack, because you know if you go back go back twenty years ago, the Scandinavians, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they were the ones that were seen as the good boys in the class to some extent that started to restrict the use of antibiotics in food producing animals. And that mindset now has permeated right across the EU and other countries, the Dutch, for example, in, in 2009, the Netherlands, they put a target in place to reduce their antibiotic use by 50%. And they're now, uh, 10 years later, they're 70% below that target that they set in, um, in 2009. There are other countries across Europe with national legislation that have restricted antibiotic use. I think from an Irish perspective though, our antibiotic use is low in, in European terms. We're in the bottom third of users. We don't have a large pig or poultry sector. We don't have a large veal sector and our cattle are, and sheep are grass-based. So for that reason, our antibiotic use is quite low. However, EU legislation is coming at the end of 2021, which will really restrict antibiotics further. So there will be a ban on the preventive use of antibiotics. So for example, where antibiotics were used for the, um, the in-feed antibiotics, so like oral CTC was used to control respiratory disease, that will be severely restricted from 2021 onwards. The critically uh, important antibiotics, so things like uh, the fluoroquinolones and third and fourth generation cephalosporins, which are widely used for respiratory disease, for example, those antibiotics will be severely restricted because they want to try and retain their use for, for uh, human use. But we have very effective vaccines. And I think if you look at it, the, the most common reason that farmers and vets use antibiotics in Ireland is to control or treat um, diarrhea and respiratory disease. So it's, it's kind of surprising then that only probably 20, 15, 20% of cows in Ireland are vaccinated to prevent diarrhea and 15 to 20 percent of calves are vaccinated to prevent respiratory disease. And I think this is the area that we'll see a greater uptake of vaccines in the next uh, two or three years to try and reduce that antibiotic use even more. OK, I mean, I suppose currently it's it's early April and you would expect uh, that a lot of, you know, dairy farmers in particular would have their BVD and their lepto shot vaccine gone in and, and may, are maybe waiting for a booster shot, etc. Is there is there any limitation or is there any restrictions on vaccine uh, importation into Ireland now with the with the COVID-19 restrictions? Just from our own perspective, and we, we'd be one of the bigger uh, manufacturers of vaccines, we've got really good uh, communication with all of the manufacturing sites on a daily basis. They're letting us know if there are any issues. And from our perspective, we can see six, nine months out. I don't foresee any issues in terms of supply of vaccines. It's really helpful that the EU have made uh, veterinary pharmaceuticals one of the priority industries. So it means that, for example, uh, similar to Ireland in, in pharmaceutical manufacture, people are going to work on a daily basis. They're producing the medicines. The same thing is happen happening for us. Most of our vaccines are manufactured in the, in the Netherlands and Germany, and it is a priority industry. So it means that the products are being manufactured on a daily basis. Also for transport, uh, the EU has made sure that um, veterinary pharmaceuticals have the green lanes uh, in ports and at borders. So they, they can bypass any restrictions that are there to make sure that there are no restrictions. So I would say, Jack, over the next three, six, nine months, I would be surprised if there were any restrictions on the supply of veterinary pharmaceuticals because of the, 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 the steps that have been put in place by the EU, but also at manufacturing plants as well. 
okay, so, some some comfort, I suppose, in in kind of extraordinary times at the moment. Uh, Fergal, the other piece, and I suppose you you've taken us out nine months down the line. The other piece is, I suppose, the other concern is Brexit in terms of potential restrictions coming down the line. How do you see Brexit in terms of the whole that whole vaccine supply piece into Ireland playing out? Yes, I think that uh, Brexit is is uh, is a risk for our industry. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I would say though that um, back in 2017, uh, we set up in MSD, we set up a working group which included people from the commercial side, like myself and the manager uh, from the general, the managing director from the UK. We also have people from regulatory affairs, uh, from supply chain, finance, to make sure that we can overcome any issues that are there. One of the things that we did in uh, last year, for example, was that we moved the um, supply of products, where products used to come from, say, Dover to Calais across the UK land bridge, we decided to uh, deliver any product that's coming to Ireland will come via uh, La Harbour, Cherbourg uh, to uh, Ross Lair or Dublin. And that avoids any risk where in the event of a hard Brexit that there were going to be uh, supply constrictions trying to get through the UK, uh, which means that Ireland would always be seen as a priority as being an EU country. So again, from that perspective, even the event of a hard Brexit at the end of this year, I don't foresee any issues with the uh, supply of products. We would have some products that are due labelled between Ireland and the UK, but the HPRA, the regulatory body here in the VMD in the UK, have been very logical about trying to make sure as much as possible that um, for the continuation of supply, that we can keep uh, those, those products uh, available. Now, if there's regulatory divergence in the UK, we will potentially have to split the packs. So we'll end up having separate Ireland only packs, or we will combine with another EU member state. And there are steps in place to make sure that there's continuity of supply. So again, Jack, I, I'd say that uh, we're similar to most of the companies, that we have a lot of um, work put in place to make sure that there are no supply issues at the end of this year. Okay, Aidan, maybe if I come to you first, um, we heard there from, from, from Fergal, it's a, it's a key time of the year, I suppose, in terms of animal health. Um, he seems to think that there'll be plenty of uh, vaccine available on the Irish market. Um, just in terms of dairy farmers, I suppose, what's, what's important at this time of the year in terms of vaccinations or where should they be? Yeah, sure. Timing is critical with all vaccines. Uh, and at this stage, I'd say most dairy farmers would have their vaccinations given to their herds uh, as it is. But the key ones at the moment, I suppose, are BVD, Lepto and IBR. Um, the, like, the thing with vaccines is you should be given them before the risk period comes into play. So I like that I, for a lot of farmers, that's before calving. So a lot of farmers give them in January now. But the next key thing then is breeding season. And, and you don't want to be given the vaccine during the breeding season because that could potentially cause a, a little bit of an upset to the cows. So you should be given it prior to the breeding season. And it would also protect the cows during the breeding season. So things like BVD or an outbreak of IBR could cause embryo loss or reduce conception rates. Uh, so these are that's the key thing at the moment. But um, look, the, the key ones are IBR, BVD, Lepto and um, and that's more or less it. Of course, black leg as well for calves. Like you need to, you know, you can't forget that. Hmm. I mean, I, again, just to move on to calves, I suppose. I mean, at this stage, you know, for a lot of the dairy farmers down south, uh, you know, the, the first of the heifer calves, the first of the replacements are kind of six, seven, eight weeks old. Um, I suppose some of them are beginning to start thinking about weaning some of those first calves. Yeah, I suppose it's it's thinking about it at this stage, Jack. Like the eldest calves, as they say, about eight weeks of age. Um, look, there's no benefit really of, of driving them on for you know longer than 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 ten to twelve weeks if they're driving fairly well. Uh, then sooner that those calves are onto solid feeds, whether that's grass and concentrate, uh, it's the best thing for them. It's cheapest and and they'll they'll drive on fairly well. But uh, look, you just need to be, to be conscious, I suppose, of the weight. And how much meal they're feeding and age is a factor but it's really the weight so freezing calves should be 100 kilos before they're weaned off milk and your your your, your crossbred type of calves could be 75 80 kilos but um it's how much meal they're eating as well so ideally they want to be eating over a kilogram of ration per day uh before you'd wean them uh, that's just a, you know it's an indicator of how well developed their rumens are uh, that they can digest solid feeds Okay, I mean the other, I suppose, particularly important group of animals at this time of the year are the, are the bowling heifers. Are they out on a lot of farms? I suppose, or what should people be looking out for? Ah, uh, yeah, like the last two weeks, I suppose, you know, the good weather has has allowed a lot of farmers to let out the bowling heifers. Key weights now coming up in the next month, so you know the breeding season will be starting down south in um, at the first of May or a little bit before that. That's only a month away. Um, the key weight there then is he's sixty percent of their mature live weight. 
So most herds mature live weight is around 580 kilograms. That means that those bull and heifers should be 60% um, of that now, which is about 350 kilos. Look, they can, sorry, at bulling time. So they have a month to achieve that. They're probably going to do a little over a kilo a day for the next while. So they should be 320 kilos now, I suppose you could say. Okay, and, and on the animal health side, I mean, they need a booster. The, the bull and heifers, they're getting their first shot of whether it's BVD or, or IBR or leptose. So they need, they need a, a booster shot, I suppose, for the bull and heifers. Isn't that right? They do, yeah. And as black leg as well, a lot of farmers forget that the heifers, the maiden heifers, will need a booster shot for black leg. And, you know, one or two losses there now could set you back badly. So it's important to think of maiden heifers as well. But look, the key thing is give them plenty of grass, give them good quality grass, um, and be on a rising plane of nutrition in the run up to breeding season. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the main story there with the heifers. Yeah, perfect. Nice one. Uh, Darren, to stay with you, and again, I suppose to stay on the animal health side of things, um, I suppose in terms of the sheep front, uh, grass tetany would be an issue that, that you know, if, if, if and when farmers are feeding or maybe they're not feeding. Like. Yeah, we haven't hit the real lush goat or the, or the real surge in goat rates that many people would think is sort of typical of grass tetany, but even outside of that, there's a lot of problems and, and we're just starting to see some of them reported. Sean uh, Diver in Tullamore Farm has a yaw that he thinks today uh, has been lost with grass tetany. Uh, you probably see a video there playing. Like, the, the, I suppose the, the high risk period at the moment, Jack, is say where lambs are three, four, five weeks of age, yaws are hitting peak milk yield and where any triggers really come. Like, so that could be a big change in weather from, from daytime temperatures to nighttime. We're seeing that at the moment. Nutritional stress and we're seeing maybe triplet yaws would be at greater risk. Uh, or I suppose maybe any yaws that might be just maybe uh, shorter grass and, and uh, under a bit of pressure that way. So the, I suppose the two areas that you're seeing there, the most common is mineral licks and concentrates. They're probably your two main sources. You can also give yaws bullets uh, or boluses, but they have a shorter uh, span. You can put in magnesium, obviously through water, uh, and you can also pasture dust. But the last two of them are really, I suppose, be sources. So what I'd be saying to people is the high risk period, make sure you have plenty of buckets out. If yours are at maybe a very high risk, like going into lush reseeds, well then you can look at say maybe buckets and feeding temporary meal for a few weeks just until they get over the high risk period. Darren, where are we in terms of the lambing season? Is it is it coming to an end, I suppose, and what should sheep farmers be thinking about now? Yeah, so for a lot of your typical mid-season lambs, uh, they're probably right bang, I suppose, maybe three quarters of the way through after coming through a surge of lambing. There will be some farmers that start lambing in April, uh, typically, but the, the big risk at the moment, and you'll see a video playing there, is, is from... I suppose maybe farmers that are over halfway through or three quarters is, is the build up of infection. And that's when you start to see maybe some of your issues with E. coli scour, with, with giant ill. And it's trying to keep on top of that. So it's to try and, I suppose, take the first opportunity that your individual lamb and pins are cleaned out as, as well as possible. You're seeing their lime being applied. That's a good way of, uh, of keeping down the disease levels and then plenty of fresh straw. Also, if you're looking at, say, in group pins, because for a lot of, I suppose, farmers, there's probably a fair bit of, of dung build up underneath it. So applying a, uh, some lime there, like what you can see, even leaving yours for a few hours to walk it in and then a deep bed of straw again, that will all help because a lot of people think that, look, the most important thing for, for the health of newborn lambs is that conditions are good and they get colostrum in it. But they forget this. If the yaws are in poor, say, bedding or if they're in dirty conditions, before they even get that colostrum, they could have sucked the yaw and they could have enough pathogens to bring on E. coli scour or their navels. There could be infection too, would bring to giant ill. So it's just to keep on top and like it's been, weather is good at the moment, so people should have a good uh, chance of getting back on track. Okay, Darren, before I leave you, maybe we'll just have a quick word on, on lamb markets. It's, it's the Easter lamb trade is, I suppose, a couple of weeks away yet, but after that, then you have Ramadan. So it's, it's an important time of the year for kind of the lamb trade and for sheep farmers. Um, what's kind of, what's happening out there? Yeah, really important uh, time, Jack. And thankfully last week, or so this week, there was there was a bit of a bounce in the markets after the collapse last, last uh, week. So not, I suppose, maybe... Two positive still on the on the spring lamb side, but prices did return maybe increased by about ten to twenty cents. So lambs are trading somewhere at the moment in most factories around six euros a kilo. Uh, there is deals being done at six ten, six twenty. 
uh, in fact, is there a, a looking for more lambs. And we're also seeing some of the marts. I know Adam will talk more about it, but starting to look for lambs for butchers or wholesalers. Buying for the Easter trade will probably be strong until maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, and then start to slacken off because it takes a couple of days to get out to key markets. But thankfully, we're starting to see some sheep meat now starting to move into some of the EU markets. Again, we're starting to see a bit of an increase in price in the UK, which is vital for us to remain competitive in EU markets. Hoggets are still going to be the big one. Like Hoggets uh, for the next few weeks is is what's going to, I suppose, dominate the trade. Prices are somewhere in the region of 5.20 to 5.40. Uh, our deal is being done up to 5.50 a kilo and a bit of bite in the market for them. What I'd be telling anyone at the moment, Jack, is while demand is there and it is strong, go through your hoggets, go through your lambs and draft anything that's there. Okay, good stuff. Thanks, Darren, for that quick update. Adam, maybe to jump into you, I see you and the, and the livestock team have been working on a, on, a, on a price calculator for stock. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, Jack, I guess with marks uh, have been restricted on having sales last week, uh, we sat down and, and we thought about what we could do. Uh, we looked at the Mark Bids app. That was the first point as much for us to look at. And that is thousands of sales data uh, going through it there for 2019 and 2020. So we developed a Mark Price Calculator, an online Mark Price Calculator that farmers can log into on farmersjournal.ee uh, and see, I guess, what way trade is going and what way the direction of the trade is going and what their animals are worth. Because at the moment with no Marks, uh, farmers don't have an, a point, I suppose, a point of access to see what, what animals are making. So, so it's a really important tool. Adam, how do how do farmers access it? Yeah, so farmersjournal.ie, Jack. Just scroll down to the beef channel and you'll see it. Um, you can access it there. Really, really simple to, to use. A couple of key steps involved in it. Uh, you'll see it here up on the screen at the moment. So we have a couple of links there on the beef channel. Uh, you go in, uh, you select, I suppose, animal type first. So we've heifers, steers, uh, dry cows, weanling bulls, weanling heifers. So you'll see here, uh, we're going to select a heifer here. Uh, the next thing is breed. We've all the main breeds there in terms of Charlie, Limousine, Semitol. We'll go for a Charlie here and we'll go top end, Jack, 30, top 33%. Uh, we'd have nothing else. 400 kilos is a, is a very popular weight that has been searched on for the last couple of days. And you see the price there coming up around that 1200 euro mark. So look, at you could spend hours at this, Jack. I know people that have spent hours at it over the last couple of days. Um, you know, going through different types of stock. Uh, steers actually has been the top uh, search so far. Uh, but this is a, a limousine steer again top 33 percent if we go for 500 kilos uh, we'll see again a value coming up so we've all the different classes of stock there uh, that people can look up and search i suppose there's one caveat to it jack when this data goes through i suppose we're looking at 2019 data for march and april and we're looking at uh, March data up until the 16th of march in 2020 so i guess beef prices have taken a bit of a tumble in the last couple of weeks so possibly uh, these prices might be a wee bit ahead of where the beef market is at the moment Okay, I mean, Adam, have you any feedback on it from farmers? I suppose when, when you know, just 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 gone live there this week. But have you have you heard anything back from farmers? Yeah, so it's speaking to farmers on the ground, they're finding it a really useful too. We've actually had seven thousand farmers have logged onto that calculator since it went up on Wednesday night. So we have a huge amount of, would say, visits to that calculator at the moment, and we're up on seven million euros worth of cattle valued. So uh, just to give you some data, we'll say that's coming through from it. Steers are actually the top searched. Uh, type of animal so far. Charlie is the top breed, followed closely by limousines. Uh, and we're looking at 400 to 500 kilos as being the weight range that people are, are most searching at the moment. And that stands to sense because I guess that's, that's grass cattle at the moment. A lot of people are looking for cattle for grass. And that 400 to 500 kilo animal probably is the po most popular animal that's going to grass. So it's so not what we're seeing at the moment, but it's a really popular tool and farmers seem to like using it. Remind me again where, where farmers can access this. Yeah, so farmersjournal.ie, and if you scroll down to the beef channel, uh, you'll see a tab there that you can click on, uh, or the top story under the beef channel. If you go into that story, there's a link within that story to, to check it out. It's free. Anybody can go on and access it there at any time. Adam, maybe just a quick one to finish up. I mean, obviously, there's the you know, the mark trade is only really getting back up and going again now, and like obviously, there's no pu no public sales, there's no farmers at these sales. Can you give us a kind of a feel for kind of what's happening or what's going to happen over the next couple of days? Yeah, I guess if we, if we take Carnew for an example, on wedding the, the calves, sale a couple of hundred calves into the mart, uh, and basically uh, the management there organised some exporters down to look at calves in batches of 30. So farmers brought in their calves that morning, um, a drop and go system. They went home and they got, we'll say, a phone call to say what price their calves were making. Look, at the majority of dairy farmers are probably happy to sell those calves. It's going to be a little bit more complicated uh, with a sale down there in Carnew on Saturday. As we have over the, over the country, marts are starting, just about starting to get going again. So it's going to be a little bit more complicated with dry stock because uh, I guess farmers aren't going to know, we'll say, what price they want. 
uh, there's going to be a little bit more to and fro in as regards price. So it took a long time to sell those calves uh, on weddings. It took maybe over four or five hours extra. Uh, so we would envisage on Saturday in Carnew, again, it'll be a long time to sell those cattle. But yeah, buyers are coming in, they're making offers on stock, uh, and it seems to be working well so far. Okay, thanks, Adam. Thanks for that. And, and, and thanks to the lads for that kind of quick roundup, I suppose, in terms of what's happening in the fields. Um, so just to finish up, I just want to play a little clip. I, I tried to catch uh, Fergal Morris out in terms of a question, uh, but there's no catching Fergal out because, as we all know, Fergal's a good man for, for reading and for researching. But I, I just put it to him about the origin of coronavirus and I suppose maybe a question around when the vaccine is available. Listen to what he said. Yeah, it's a good question, Jack. Uh, it appears that it originated in China um, from bats originally. Bats are the reservoir of quite a lot of nasty viruses. And it appears that they've evolved over millions of years to cope with these nasty viruses. Uh, but when they jump species into other species, you tend to see a quite severe outbreaks. So we've seen this before. Uh, rabies is a good example of it. It originally came from bats. And this particular virus, though, appeared to get into the pangolin, which is a, a scaly anteater, which is uh, found in Southeast uh, Asia, but also in Africa as well. And from there, it got into the human population in uh, Hubei or in, in Wuhan in China. And from there, it spread around the rest of the world. And I think what it shows is the, how connected we are now by comparison with say 15 or 20 years ago. So SARS also originated in Southeast Asia but it didn't spread as far. It spread into Southeast Asia and some other countries like Canada, for example, that has a large Chinese population uh, were affected by SARS. But in the case of um, this virus, COVID-19, it spread much, much further. On the science side, we have very effective tests to detect it. And um, there's just a shortage of the tests. That's part of the problem at the moment. There are very effective tests coming to look at the antibody level. So this will show if we've been exposed to the virus and if we've got protection, which is a good thing to know, it will potentially allow people to go back to work as well if you know that you're exposed and are protected. Uh, we've seen some very good treatments uh, being tested that are very good for uh, other viruses like HIV, for example. They seem to, to show good promise as a treatment, some effective anti-inflammatories. But also then on the vaccine front, as you said, it's really vaccines that will finally control this. And there are at least 20 projects globally now uh, where companies are looking at uh, the structure of the virus and how to create vaccines against it. Again, if you go back 15, 20 years ago, it would have taken years to produce a vaccine. In this case, uh, the structure of the virus was released by the Chinese um, uh, scientific research community in January, and we're already testing, uh, some companies are testing vaccines already. I expect the first vaccine we might see even before the end of 2020 but realistically, most of the vaccines will come in quarter one, quarter two, 2021. Okay, so as usual, Fergal had an answer for me on the on the coronavirus and when the vaccine is coming. So that's all we have for this week, folks. Uh, so again, I suppose thanks to Fergal, thanks to Adam, Aidan and Darren for the contributions. Um, don't forget, if you're interested in the policy and the, the news side of things in our in another episode of uh, Farm Tech Talks, you can you can tune in to Justin, Katrina, Tara McCarthy and, and Lorcan Allen. Um, look, I, I, I suppose I just need to again thank our sponsors, Ornua, MSD Animal Health, uh, Board BIA and FBD for making this outside broadcast happen. Stay safe and safe farming. <laughs>